Psalm 37 tonight, and we uh, started several weeks ago looking at this psalm. And if I had to give kind of a title to the whole psalm, I'd say it's Trust, Don't Fret. Trust, Don't Fret. It starts out with the command, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. And, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to get upset because... We see good things happen to bad people and we see bad things happen to people who do good. And that seems to us unfair. We begin to worry about that. We begin to fret over that. We begin to seethe over that and even envy them. Envy them what they have and what because we don't have it as good as them in our opinion sometimes. And We've already seen uh, the first six verses in this this psalm and tonight we're going to cover verses... 7 through 11. And so let's pick up reading there in verse number 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I ask for your help again tonight as we look into your word and we examine this psalm and the truth that you gave to us through the pen of King David many, many years ago. Lord, we know that he was very well acquainted with the unfairness of life as many times he was on the receiving end of unfair anger and wrath. But Lord, you taught him to trust in you and to wait for you. And Lord, would you teach us the same? That we would not be anxious and worry about the disparities that we perceive in this life, but we would just wait on You to make it all right. Lord, give us that peace that passes all understanding. The peace that the world cannot give. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to kind of recap what we have learned so far in the first six verses... We've seen that instead of fretting over the wicked and envying them, we should trust God and do good. We must delight ourselves in the Lord and commit our ways to Him. And when we do, He works in us to give us the desires of our hearts and to bring our ways to pass. And as we come to verse number 7, we are given another command, which is to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Instead of being anxious and angry about the unfairness of life, we need to relax and wait on God to work everything out in His time. Look how David develops this thought in these verses here. In the first part of verse number 7, we find again that command to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Now this is obviously in contrast to that spirit of fretting and envying that we are so tempted to when we see people who do bad things experiencing good in this life. Instead of that, we need to, we need to relax. We need to rest. The word in the, uh, in the original is literally translated as keep silent. So it's not a rest as in a sense of, of you know, being asleep and being unaware of what is going on around you, but rather it's a, it's a choice to relax. The word is translated in Leviticus 10 and verse number 3 as held his peace. Aaron held his peace. In other words, he made a choice. You know what? I'm not going to say anything here. I'm just going to be quiet. Certainly, we need to restrain our tongues whenever we see the disparities in life and we perceive that things are unfair and we're tempted uh, to start murmuring and complaining against God, against life, against the circumstances, against other people, whatever it might be. We need to restrain our tongues instead of running our mouths when we think that we are the victim of injustice. And when we see the 
wicked are succeeding in their plots. We need to learn to be silent. We need to say no to anxiety and to worry. You know, many times it feels like you can't say no. It feels like anxiety and worrying and fretting overwhelm you. But the truth is you have a choice to make about what you allow your mind to dwell on. And you can either choose to be anxious or you can choose to rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. How is it that when we see the disparity of life that we can rest easy? By resting in the Lord. You see, if you're looking for peace in your circumstances, you're going to be constantly disappointed. Have you figured out that life changes? Nothing stays the same. There's always going to be variables. There's always going to be unexpected circumstances. And if you are depending on your circumstances for your peace, you're going to have very little of it. Don't rest in your circumstances. Can I say, don't rest in your friends or family either. Now, hopefully God has given you some great friends and some great family members who are a blessing and a help to you. But compared to the help of God, the help of man is vain. Even the best people with the best of intentions can let you down. God never will. Don't rest in your circumstances. Don't rest in your circle of friends. Instead, rest in the Creator God. Rest in the Lord, he says. We rest in the Lord. We choose to trust Him because we know that sooner or later He will make all things right. Psalm 4 and verse number 8, the psalmist said there, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Rest. Be at peace in the Lord. Psalm 46 and verse number 10, Be still and know that I am God. So many times that is our biggest need, is to just be still. Especially when we're going through trials. We get so agitated We get so up in arms about things and we want to do something to alleviate the the pressure or the pain that we're under. And Instead of just being still, we're constantly doing something, anything, everything, except trusting God. Rest in the Lord. Then he says, wait patiently for Him. I like how the Holy Spirit didn't just say, wait for Him. He said, wait patiently for him. Because it is possible to wait impatiently, is it not? Wait patiently for him. Our impatience is often the cause of our anxieties. Think about that. In fact, I would encourage you, if you are in the habit of writing in your Bible, next to verse number 7, write that statement down. Our impatience is often the cause of our anxieties. It's because we're not willing to wait for God to work it out that we get so tied in knots about things. Now, many times we have no control over the waiting part. The timeline is determined for us and we're just along for the ride but we absolutely can control the patience part. How we wait. Because if we're waiting with that spirit of anxiety and always being agitated and wanting to see it, uh, uh, everything done and finished and figured out now, we're going to wear ourselves out. We're going to run ourselves ragged. When we're unwilling to wait for God, we exhaust ourselves wishing that He would hurry up. Now, am I alone in this struggle? Or have you also been in situations where you're just like, God, would you please hurry up here? This is taking forever. It's helpful to remember that God is not bound by time. He literally cannot be late. It's impossible. God cannot be late. 
The day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Time makes no difference to Him. Makes a lot of difference to us, I know, but not to God. And that's why we don't rest in us or our circumstances. We rest in God who is not bound by time. And we wait patiently for Him. God cannot be late. I know you remember the story of Lazarus, John chapter 11. Martha sends word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. A couple days later, Jesus says, all right, let's go and visit. When he gets to where Mary and Martha are, they come and they meet him and Martha says, basically, you're too late. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But you weren't here is the implication and so he did. You're too late, Jesus. Jesus assured her that Lazarus would rise again and, and she took that as only a promise of eternal life in the future when Jesus meant it as both. Eternal life in the future because Lazarus believed, but also Jesus was literally going to go raise him from the dead. He goes to the tomb and, and there Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five, 35. And he tells them to, to open the tomb and Martha objects again, he's been dead four days. His body has begun to decompose. Lord, what are you doing? This You're too late. But she found out that he was right on time. Lazarus, come forth. And here he comes, still bound in grave clothes, waddling out of the tomb. Jesus said, loose him. Get those grave clothes off of him. See, Jesus wasn't late. God is never late. So wait patiently for Him. Yeah, but I've got this deadline. Wait patiently for Him. Yeah, but if it doesn't happen by this time, wait patiently for Him. We have all of these ideas about when things should happen. And believe me, I'm as guilty or more guilty than anyone. But God's deadlines are a lot better than ours. Wait patiently for Him. There's a connection here too between the resting and the patience because you cannot rest if you are impatient. Impatience is exhausting. On the other hand, if you wait on the Lord, your strength will be renewed. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. What does it say? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Wait on Him. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. But then the verse goes on to say, Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Now here we have an acknowledgement that wicked people often succeed. Is that not true? Do wicked people not often succeed in the tasks that they set out to, to do? They do prosper in their way. They do bring their wicked devices to pass. They make their plans and they see their plans through to fruition many times. We need to acknowledge that. It doesn't do anybody any good to have this this fairy tale version of Christianity that says that if you're a Christian and you follow Jesus, only good things will ever happen to you because only bad things ever happen to people who don't. That's not how life works. It's more complicated than that. And often the wicked succeed in carrying out their plans. But what this verse says is don't worry about it. Fret not thyself. There's that command again, that idea of, of being anxious and, and seething over the injustice that you perceive. Don't do that. Don't worry about it. If you believe that God is sovereign, if you believe that God's got it all under control, if you believe that His timing is best, if you believe that sooner or later it's all going to work out and the righteous will be revealed as righteous, according to verse number 6, and, and you believe that the righteous will be rewarded and that the wicked will be punished, well then don't worry about it. God's got it under control. But let's take it another step farther here. Let's pause for a moment and let's try to understand the mind of God in this situation. Because this is a basic question that we ask, if not out loud, 
we think it through. And that is this, why does, why does God allow wicked people to experience good things? Why does he do that? Would, would it not be better for him just to, just to bring down the proverbial hammer constantly on them? But you need to understand that that's not who God is. God is a long-suffering God. And because God is long-suffering, He puts up with the wicked. He puts up with it. And He even allows them to succeed. Because God ultimately wants to bring them to a place of repentance. And Romans 2.4 says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You're not upset when God is still good to you when you do wrong, are you? Jonah was not upset when he prayed a prayer of repentance in the belly of the well and God commanded that well to vomit it out on shore and he was saved alive. Jonah wasn't upset about that. We're not upset when we've done wrong and we come to God and, and He is merciful to us and, and He restores us to a place of blessing. We're not upset about God's goodness then. We appreciate it. and We need to understand that God extends that goodness to everyone. He is long-suffering to us, word. 2 Peter 3.9 says, Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, speaking of Jonah, his problem was that he felt like he and the people who were like him were the only ones who should benefit from God's mercy and grace. The Ninevites weren't worthy, in his opinion. And that's why he was angry and upset when God was merciful to them. He said, isn't this what I said? That you are God that's slow to anger and merciful and gracious and you repent of the evil? I, I knew this is what you were going to do, God. The reason that God is patient with the wicked, the reason that He is even good to them many times, it's because He wants to bring them to repentance. Remember, when the rain falls, it falls on the evil and the just alike. Why? Because God's a good God. He's righteous and He's holy and one day He will judge them finally if they continue in their rebellion and their rejection. But if we begin to think of it through that lens, I believe it will help us fret not because of him who prospereth in his way and because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. It'll help us not worry about it. And remember, God's got this under control. He's got a reason for this. And here's another thing to consider. Think of how much glory you can get God if you will choose not to fret and worry, but instead rest and be patient. You know, the wicked, they can only rest easy when things are going their way. That's the only time when they can rest easy. When life is perfectly smooth, everything's going right, there's no bad news, ah, then they can relax. The wicked, that's the only time that they can do that. But those who trust in the Lord, their peace is not dependent on their circumstances. The wicked lose sleep trying to solve problems. They stress themselves out trying to answer all the questions. They wallow in despair when they think that things are hopeless. But the righteous trust God to answer all the questions. And they have the hope that in the end, everything is going to work out for our good and God's glory. We can rest easy even in the most difficult times. And the lost look on at the Christian going through a great trial but going through it with a peace and a calmness. And they say, how in the world? How are you not a basket case? How, is your, how are you not flying apart? What kind of drugs are you taking? This doesn't make any sense. Because we have a peace that only God gives. Philippians 4, 
tells us to be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That peace that God gives us, it passes human understanding. It's beyond their comprehension. They don't get it. So think about how much glory you can get, God, if you will choose just to rest and be patient. If you will choose not to look to your circumstances for peace, but to God. Now look with me again at verse number 8. Before, before we go there, I want to share this quote with you from, from Spurgeon, actually. He said this, Determine, let the wicked succeed as they may, that you will treat the matter with indifference, and never allow a question to be raised as to the righteousness and goodness of the Lord. What if the wicked devices succeed and your own plans are defeated? There is more of the love of God in your defeats than in the successes of the wicked. Something to think about. And so verse 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. There's a progression, I believe, indicated here, going all the way back to verse number 1. We're told not to fret. We're told not to envy. And now we're told to cease from anger and forsake wrath. When we allow ourselves to fret about the successes of the wicked, we begin to envy them what they have. It's just a very short step to the next wrong emotion, that of anger. We get angry about the situation. We get angry at the wicked and if we allow ourselves to stew in that anger, then we end up in that fourth step, which is the wrath. That, that explosion of anger. That losing of our temper, if you will. We get angry at the circumstances of life. We get angry at the wicked because we want what they have. And worse still, we get angry at God for letting it happen. You know, when we let that anger turn to wrath, we then blow up, we blow up at others, we lose our temper, and sometimes we can even lose our temper with God. And losing your temper with God is about as smart as punching a brick wall. The only person it's going to hurt is you. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. See, what happens is when we allow ourselves to go down this road of envying the evildoers, and we get angry and we lose our temper with God, with others, we've now put ourselves in a position where we are the evildoer. We are now that person that we had been tempted to envy. We're no longer righteous because we're, we're not trusting God. We're not waiting on Him. We're not delighting ourselves in the Lord. We are being selfish. We are being arrogant. And we become the evildoer. We become the wicked one because we are questioning and condemning God. And that's what it boils down to. When you say this isn't right, it should be the other way around, and, and this is, God did something wrong here, you are now putting your place, your, your, yourself in the place of judging God. You're condemning Him. Who do we think we are to stand in judgment of Almighty God? Don't do that. Cease from it. Why? Because verse 9 says, For evildoers shall be cut off. Don't envy the evildoers and don't be a doer of evil because evildoers will be cut off. That happiness that you perceive them to be enjoying is going to be very short-lived. 
The pleasures of sin are but for a season. The material things that they've amassed are temporary and are all going to burn up one day. They're going to be cut off. Now the truth is life is short for everyone. Man that is born of woman is of few days, Job said, and full of trouble. Our life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. And for the wicked, the end of this life means the end of any chance at happiness. What little happiness they enjoyed here on this earth is done. That's it. There is no more. Because for the rest of eternity, they will be separated from God and be tormented in a place called hell. Don't envy them. They're going to be cut off. That's why it is, it's called being cut off. God never describes the death of the righteous that way. He doesn't say the righteous will be cut off. The death of the righteous is described much differently in Scripture. Often it's described as sleep. I don't know about you, but sleep is always appealing to me. But the death of the righteous, it's so different from the death of the wicked. Remember when Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. When Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. What a beautiful picture. But the rich man, he also died. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. The death of the wicked ends all chances they had for happiness. In this life, they could have repented, they could have trusted Christ, they could have received eternal life and had the promise of everlasting happiness, but they rejected Christ and instead they chose to seek happiness in their wickedness here on earth. And because of that, when this life ended, that was it. Evildoers shall be cut off. As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Friend, you don't need to be as concerned about your happiness right now as you should be concerned about your happiness in eternity. Don't allow the material things of this life to so cloud your judgment that you make the mistake of living for temporary things instead of living for eternity. Evildoers shall be cut off, but notice what verse 9 goes on to say, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. What a contrast. If you rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him, then you will inherit the earth. For the Israelites, that was a literal promise. The actual dirt that comprised the promised land was theirs for the keeping as long as they were in a right fellowship with God. As long as they obeyed Him, God would bless them with prosperity and peace in the land. And for the Christian today, the promise still applies in principle. Jesus repeated this promise in Matthew 5 and verse number 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In fact, this promise was so significant that it became used as an expression to denote any great blessings or perhaps the sum of all blessings that God gives. In other words, when you wait on the Lord, God will bless you in every way. And that blessing will be an everlasting blessing. No doubt you've heard of the, the story Pilgrim's Progress. And there's a couple characters in that story. One is named Passion and one is named Patience. Passion has his good things first and they are soon over. But Patience has his good things last and they last forever. You ever heard the expression, saving the best for last? That's really what we're talking about here. We can choose to live for ourselves in the here and now and waste our lives. We can choose to live for eternity and invest our lives. Now look at verse number 10. It says, for yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. 
Now again, we have this reminder that life is short and for the wicked it will be cut short. The successes of the wicked are short-lived, but then what? Even if the wicked make it all the way to the grave having never experienced real hardship, there is an eternity of torment awaiting them. The wicked will be cut short. In just a little while they shall not be. But there's an emphasis in verse number 10 in that second phrase. It says, Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place. You know what that implies? means that you're still there and He's not. You will diligently consider His place where the wicked used to be and, and you'll be looking for Him when he, in that place where He was enjoying so much, but He's not going to be there. You'll be there, but He will not. See, the idea here is that the righteous are preserved by God, but the wicked are destroyed. You, the righteous one, will diligently examine the former place of the wicked and he will not be there. And now notice verse number 11. It says, But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Again, Jesus quoted this verse in the Sermon on the Mount. Verse number 10 says, The righteous will survive the wicked. But our existence, notice this, is not going to be just mere existence, you know, trying to muddle through. It's, okay, we survived, but, you know, big deal, what fun is that? The promise here is that we will delight ourselves with an abundance of peace. So it's not just, I'm going to exist, it's I get to enjoy my existence. That's God's promise to the righteous. Delight. Yourself in the abundance of peace is what it says. Now, we, we've already come across this word delight before, have we not? Back in verse number 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. And now verse number 11 tells us that for the meek, for those who are righteous, those who are trusting God and doing good, and who are ceasing from anger and wrath, who are waiting patiently on Him, they will delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you delight. So it's not just existence, it's enjoyment. God does not mean for the Christian life to be a drudgery. God does not mean that every moment that we exist on this dirt ball called earth That we be in misery. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have hope. He wants us to have a smile. Now not every moment of life is enjoyable. There's many sorrows. There are griefs that we endure. But we can have joy throughout our lives, the very same way that we rest in moments of adversity, that is, in the Lord. We rest in the Lord, and we have joy in the Lord. What does Philippians 4 and verse number 4 say? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Our delight comes through the abundance of peace, verse 11 says. We will delight ourselves through an abundance of peace. What is an abundance? It's more than enough. Do you have more than enough peace in your life? When a a trial comes, do you have more than enough peace? Or do you find yourself being consumed with anxiety? You see, the kind of peace that God gives is not just barely enough. It's more than enough. He wants to give us an abundance of peace. He wants to give us so much peace we can give it away. An abundance of peace. 
God gives more peace, more than enough to overcome the hardships that we experience. Now let's stop and think about this for a moment. The wicked often prosper in their way. They bring their wicked devices to pass and, and many times they enjoy material prosperity. They have an abundance of, of money. They have an abundance of property and material things. But would you rather have an abundance of money without peace or an abundance of peace even if you are poor? Which would you rather have? Would you rather have millions of dollars in the bank but a life that is full of anxiety and turmoil? Would you rather have the peace of God even if it means being poor in the eyes of this world? Well, Proverbs 17.1 answers the question when it says, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. And that's not just talking about family relations there. That's a principle of life. That it is better to have peace in your heart, even if you only have a few pennies in the bank, than it is to have all the material possessions of the world and lack peace. So what do we need to do? Going back to verse number 7, we need to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Can I just put it this way? Chill out and trust God. Chill out and just trust God. Because if we allow ourselves to get impatient, envious, it will turn to anger. And that anger will turn to wrath. And we will put ourselves in a position of being the evildoer. And when that happens, God's hand of blessing is going to be taken from our lives. Not because God rejects us, but because He loves us too much to let us go down that path of anger and wrath and envy without intervening. So don't go there. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him.